My name is Dana Inkster, and I am the publisher of Lethbridge Living Magazine. And I, um, this is our maiden voyage of doing video adaptation of the print magazine. In the fall of 2018, we started the Lethbridge Living Endowment Fund with the Community Foundation of Lethbridge and Southern Alberta. And so what that means is that uh, for those people who would like to contribute to the Lethbridge Living Endowment Fund, donations between $5 up to thousands of dollars are being accepted. And once that fund reaches $10,000, Lethbridge Living will give grants to local charities in our community. So what that means is that Lethbridge Living is now the magazine that gives back to the community. We have been wonderful stewards of stories and now we want to be sure to support local charities in any way that we can. Your community is important to you. Have you ever wanted to strengthen it while creating a lasting legacy in the process? The Community Foundation of Lethbridge and Southwestern Alberta works with generous people to create meaningful support for the causes and organizations important to them. We do this by establishing endowment funds. Sound complicated? It's easier than you think. We've developed and refined a process to put together all the pieces of the puzzle for creating a meaningful, lasting legacy. Whether you're an individual, family, business, or a charity, the process is simple. The first step is to identify what's important to you. We will help you understand how your fund will work and ensure that it supports what is meaningful to you. Next, we make an agreement. There's still no obligation to you. The agreement simply lets you know that we understand your goals and how much involvement you wish to have in granting from your new fund. Do you want to stay active in the annual charity selection process? Focus locally or further afield or take a hands-off approach and leave the decisions to us. Once an agreement is made, it's time to get started. You can start your fund with a lump sum or through installments. When your fund reaches $10,000, it becomes self-sustaining, but you don't have to stop there. You can continue to grow your fund in a way that suits your charitable goals. Whatever you decide, we help you make your community strong and vibrant. To learn more about how you can make a long-term difference, contact us today. So thank you again, welcome um, to Lethbridge Living. Mm -hmm. And um, today I just was hoping to chat about the Chinook Sexual Assault Center. Mm -hmm. So Bill, you are the president of the board. Yes. And Christine, you are the CEO. Yes. Oh. Bill is probably better at that in the last couple of years is when yeah. it really came to fruition. Yeah, um, so I started working um, with the Sexual Violence Action Committee here in, in the city and with them I was a representative as part of ASAS which, which is the Alberta Association of Sexual Assault Services. And I started to go around and do meetings in, in the province with them and I saw what other cities had, uh, other places had and, and we didn't have a sexual assault center here. So in the fall of 2016, I put a pro proposal into the government for them to fund a sexual assault center here. And it took about two full years, but we finally got our, our funding this fall, 2018, and opened our doors. And mm -hmm. I think historically it's always been, there's been such a, a sense of shame that we have created around sexual violence. Uh, that we have uh, actually made people feel like they're at fault for their victimization. And I think that's the biggest barrier for any of us to, to get over and to let people know that we believe them, their stories are real, they happened, and that there is help there and they aren't broken when this has happened. It just means that life is taking a different path right now and that we can help you find that path again of where you want to be. Uh, so I think for me, that's always been something that's kept people back from both disclosing or really 
recognizing how their life has changed. Yeah, I, I agree, agree with that. It's, um, it's also important to, to note that it's not about just coming to, to the center, mm -hmm. th that we're going to be mobile in, in the community, we're going to meet people mm -hmm. where they need to meet, we're going to provide services where they feel um, best com comfortable and, and willing to speak and feel safe. Mm -hmm. all that. Of course our doors uh, get to fling open on January 7th. Uh, we've had some volunteers who've come in to help, you know, do some painting, uh, fix things for me that needed to be fixed, mm -hmm. haul out recycling and things like that as we're setting up. Uh, but certainly we want to be working into having uh, an active volunteer program. I've had uh, someone who uh, actually ran a rape crisis center in another city who already made contact saying, you know, if you're going to do crisis lines or anything else like that, I'd love to come in and volunteer and do that. So those are things that we're going to be building uh, towards because we want to make sure that we're doing something that's going to be credible, that's going to be worthwhile for volunteers so that they feel valued as well in what they're doing and that they have the right training to be able to do it as well. So that's going to be coming. Uh, we're looking at doing, you know, education um, programs more than awareness. Awareness has that fleeting five minute, you know, sort of blip on the radar. We really want to get in and to help change some attitudes. So there's some education programs that we're looking at doing. <laughs> I think the, com the community would be some surprised when we're speaking mm -hmm. of sexual violence, violence about the actual num numbers statistically. One in six for, for males and one in three for fem females. Mm -hmm. Na nationally, that's a number. And I think people don't un understand that, that over the yeah. course of a lifetime, that's the average. And the different ages that it hits. You know, it, it, there's a lot of children that are impacted by, by sexual abuse. Uh, but, you know, this is something that, uh, you know, seniors also aren't um, immune to, to having happened. Uh, the amount of people, I think, that have experienced historical violence that, uh, you know, slowly come out and let people mm -hmm. know about it, I think is always quite shocking that, you know, there's so many people, you could swing around in a, in a classroom and there's people there that are impacted. Uh, so I think just like, like Phil has, uh, has referenced, that the vast uh, numbers are impacted by some sort of sexual assault, sexual violence in their life. Yeah. I think there's been a bit of a shift and certainly some of the research that's come out regarding the Me Too movement is that there's been a 29% increase of police reporting because of course reporting to the police is one of the lowest activities that we saw was about 5% of victims will go to the police, certainly less than 10%. So. Uh, we've seen a definite increase. I think what's happened is that it, it's helped some people become a little bit more comfortable in telling their story and that there's power in telling the story and we know that people have to turn to social media just to be heard. Um, so I think there's a little bit more uh, that people are a little bit more conscious about it but there's still a long ways to go. We're still seeing um, some deep-rooted attitudes that are feeding into things like rape culture um, that are just second nature to, I think to people. Uh, if we look at the recent case that was in Ontario with the school, with the uh, St. Michael School, yeah, St. Michael yeah. School, that you know where the young man was violated with a broomstick, um, and how closed the system was initially in their response to it as well, and you know which also shadows thing and things in a lot of shame, but may not get victims what they need for support right away. Um, we're still seeing issues within you know court systems and what's happening with sentencing or or the rest. So there's lots I think that we still need to do so I don't think we should be resting our laurels on the Me Too movement and I believe you completely that needs to continue um, and we know that there's people that are questioning if Me Too is actually creating you know the generation of where we're doing a lot of uh, blaming of, of all men and that's not the case uh, so I think there's a lot of education that's being shown that that needs to come with that as well. I think the um, the key for some for this now for young people coming in is is they're being taught some something that I I wasn't taught when I first started it was about trauma, and about understanding people and how they're affected by these type of things and and really having that compassion and that empathy for them. Mm -hmm. And there are some wonderful resources online that are free. Alberta Health Services has has a wonderful uh, program on trauma-informed care that people can look up and actually work through themselves to find out a little bit more about what trauma is and what trauma-informed uh, care is. So again, you know, echoing what uh, Bill has said is to, to get yourself educated on, on what that is. The times have changed and we need to evolve 
And so this is the next part of our evolution in providing services. For those moving to the area, the Western Canadian domain lay wild and vast across the endless horizon. Where other newcomers saw an arid expanse of bare land, the Galts, Alexander and Elliot, father and son, were inspired by opportunity. Their imagination saw a grand vision, railways to bring new settlers from across the rolling hills a network of irrigation channels that could create green and fertile land, and coal mines to unlock from the hills the energy to power this new colony. Galt, we celebrate the men who carried this name. Their ambition, their optimism, and ultimately, their success in bringing settlement and prosperity to the region created a sense of place that remains core to the community's identity. From childhood, he must have dreamt of Canada, a land that promised adventure and a swift success to enterprising. Born in 1817 in London, England, Alexander Tillich Galt was son to Scottish poet John Galt, famous for philosophy about the New World. As a young idealist, 18-year-old Galt moved to Sherbrooke, Lower Canada, and he soon became active in politics. Alexander Galt's vision of a strong Canada stretching from coast to coast mirrored the newly forming nation's own interest in Western expansion. It was Galt who first suggested uniting the British North American provinces and the Northwest. While this union had not been immediately acted upon, Galt's vision and influence over his fellow politicians make him the real father of Confederation. During this time, Galt's vision for what Canada could be made him one of the first choices for the position that was to become the Prime Minister, but declined to focus exclusively on the financial and economic priorities needed for Canada's foundation. Galt convinced the federal government that the most effective way to develop and settle the West was through business opportunity. For thousands of years, southern Alberta had been inhabited by the Blackfoot people and now was about to go through a large transition. Elliot Torrance Galt, born May 24, 1850 in Sherbrooke, Quebec, through his education had been carefully groomed for a business career. Elliot Galt's duties took him across the prairies and he quickly adapted to life in the Canadian West. Elliot visited a local mine. The land was so rich with coal, black seams were poking out from the coulee walls. Convinced of the area's potential, Alexander enticed his London associates to fund a new company to extract this resource, forming the Northwestern Coal and Navigation Company. His son Elliot became his business partner. Alexander mentored his son in business, and they spent the next several years developing his coal mine, acquiring land, and creating an expansive rail network connecting their company's coal to the rest of Canada and the United States. The Galts laid out plans for a town site in 1884, 
naming streets after company shareholders. As a result of these efforts, the town of Coalbanks was renamed on October 15, 1885. It would now be known as Lethbridge, home to a burgeoning community. Over the next two decades, Elliot Galt's diplomacy, integrity, and good judgment earned him the goodwill of investors and business associates. He recognized the expertise in people from all backgrounds. Change and economic upswing would spark Elliott's literally groundbreaking contribution to southern Alberta, the construction of a vast irrigation network. To create the expansive irrigation project, Elliott appealed to the Church of Latter-day Saints community to utilize their labor and expertise in the area for the benefit of all. Water was turned on at the head of the main canal at St. Mary River in July 1900, bringing water to dry areas and creating productive farms. This was Elliot Galt's most transformative achievement for the city of Lethbridge, Southern Alberta, and Canada. It is unlikely that Sir Alexander or Elliot Galt could have imagined Lethbridge as it is today. ambition laid the foundation for an industrialized settlement of southern Alberta. The hospital the Galts built to serve and foster the health of the community they helped create is now a symbol that carries their name and harbors their contributions through history their name and the Galt Museum and Archives now serves as a bridge between the past and future. Thank you so much, Susan Burroughs Johnson, for coming in today. It's nice and I was to just see you. hoping you and I uh, could talk about the Gaunt Museum and Archives and um, some of the winter activities for 2019. I know you have a new exhibit coming yes, up. Yes, we do. We're actually, we're excited about the new exhibit. Well, we get pretty excited about as we start a new one. Um, but this one's t about home and about people's understanding of home and what reminds them of home. And we've called to the community and asked people to help us with that. I think that we take our obligations to our community very seriously. And, and as we reflected, and it was three or four years before 2017, we reflected on what, what should we be doing. And we feel, uh, or we felt at that point, badly that people didn't know who the Galts were. We have Galt Garden, we have Galt Museum, we have things named for that family, but we don't know who they are. Some people thought they were coal miners, and I guess they were kind of, but they really did um, other pieces to, to the development of our city. So we were really delighted to participate in putting those statues out to talk about Elliot and Sir Alexander, 
and, and then to have the film done about the Galts. We were delighted. And it's been placed in the exhibit hall and been used for schools and special events. So um, we take uh, the explanation of our local history very seriously. And um, I, as far as I can tell, the community is delighted with both projects. You know, we've, we've been pondering, and you, uh, we've had Blackfoot interpreters for 16 and a half years. We really wanted to add some more uh, emphasis to the indigenous history of the area. So we piloted last year a program, Rebecca Many Gray Horses was our researcher, and delivered with elders the first two series, and then Blanche Bruce had delivered the, the third series. And we've been evaluating and providing feedback. It's a well-loved program. We added Blackfoot language. So we are running language programming Thursday nights. We had 60 people to the first session. Wow, so. that's really amazing because uh, in the winter issue of Lethbridge Living magazine, uh, Les Baldwin has written a piece uh, on the back page, and it makes reference to 2019 being the year of Indigenous it languages. Is. So is. that's exciting, kind of community, kind of organizing to really retain our, our cultural sense of place. I was taken to Tacos Made in Mexico by Killeen Devine, who's an art administrator and a graphic designer here in Lethbridge. And I'd never been, but she's a regular. Wow. Uh, she's a little more uh, world-traveled than I am, and so she sees it as her little uh, taste of Southern California, is what she told me, the little uh, hole-in-the-wall restaurant. Uh, it's gotten a lot of buzz around the city, and but I hadn't been yet, and uh, went in, and uh, I was really impressed. It's a, a very overwhelming space. It's very tiny, but uh, there's so much sense things going on, beautiful colors, uh, paper art all over the ceiling, and uh, the smells and flavors and everything. I was very impressed. Nice. It was a really neat experience. Nice. It, very, it, it really struck a chord with me just because it's something that uh, uh, I had been thinking about. Uh, I'd even been uh, talking to uh, Julie Van Rosendahl from Calgary about some of the ways that I've represented food in my other comics. Um, it, sometimes I incorporate recipes right into the narrative of the comic, things like that. Uh, sometimes uh, food will be the catalyst of a conversation with someone in the public, that sort of thing. So the idea of popping into these little uh, places that are beloved by some but maybe not on everyone's radar uh, was really appealing to me. Uh, and any time that I get to uh, just tell the stories, there's just some neat and unusual things happening in the city, uh, is really exciting. Sometimes in Lethbridge, it can be challenging to open up a, a, a restaurant where not only do you need to uh, overcome the media power of some of the bigger chains but also the fact that you've maybe got to do some education and uh, in my experience I've had to have some education even as I sit down in those restaurants just because the food might be different from our experience or uh, we just need to start chatting up the staff to find out the the best way to order um, and having a little help that way or uh, knowing somebody and hopefully the Sluchu review can be that somebody to help you feel a little more confident when you sit down in somewhere new. Typically, I've uh, been calling it a cartoonist in residence in the sense that uh, they recognize what I do and they, they know that I show a lot of respect for the people that I'm with and around when I'm drawing and, and depicting them. Some people are worried when they hear cartoonists because they think editorial cartoonists or they think caricature and uh, I would say aggressive uh, you know, exaggeration. But uh, really I'm, I'm there in thinking of more of as a documentarian or, or a reporting where I'm just taking in conversations and reproducing it or uh, re you know, uh, contextualizing it as best I can. And so really I'm just setting up my little table in a public space and people are walking past me. You see someone at a drawing table, it looks weird, it's a magnet. People come in and say hi and what are you, who are you and what are you doing? And they just start telling me some stories. I, it's almost like a bartender thing where the, I don't know why they open up to me but set up that little drawing table and everybody likes me and trusts me and uh, comes to say hi. 
And uh, it's just capturing little moments, particularly moments that maybe not everybody else might have noticed or they're, you know, I've only have a few seconds with the person or minutes and then I'm just drawing one voice caption that is just trying to capture a bit of the feeling of what it was like to be in that place and to meet those people. And uh, it's really kind of caught on as something kind of special to, to bring in and people are there to have a different experience. I'm not the focus, I'm just there. And then they come and visit me and they see the experience they just had, but maybe shown in a different way or from a different perspective. And uh, it's been really rewarding. Uh, as long as I can remember. Yeah. And really the only skill I possess. <laughs> Was, there was no even yeah no even my parents gave up and after high school it just well so obviously you're, you're going guy. to do something arty and you're going to be wow. poor and hungry forever no wrong <laughs> wrong uh, it, no it was there really just no question and uh, as soon as I became more comfortable with my audience and being, became more comfortable with my skills to the point where I could offer them to people to tell their stories then then I, I really uh, found a comfortable niche in whatever community I find myself in and Lethbridge has been like Moncton in some ways where I've have had opportunities in Crow's Nest Pass or I've had opportunities in Tabor Medicine Hat where I've been able to take take what I do and to celebrate other communities as well. Uh, yes they do. Uh, I am notoriously uh, heavily booked <laughs> and uh, I'm booking into March uh, right now but uh, we're in December and uh, so yeah you just need to not be in a rush <laughs> but uh, quite often too just because of the work that I do and also I host the Lethbridge Drink and Draw at the Owl every month uh, I have a pretty good handle on the cartooning and artist community here as well uh, because I'm I keep sticking my face everywhere I'm a little higher profile if the job if the commission isn't one that's really a good fit for me chances are I know who it might be a good fit for mm -hmm. and uh, I pride myself on being able to connect other artists in Lethbridge uh, with a, a client that might be a better match for them whether it could be the nature of the style of art or maybe even the uh, the person that they are Yeah, very shortly after we moved here, uh, I started up a Lethbridge Drink and Draw, and uh, it's very open. There's no registration. There's no you don't come in and I tell you what to do or anything like that. You could collaborate on drawing on a piece of paper with me or with other people around the table, or you might be working in your sketchbook. We have professionals in the community who come and actually do their work. Like instead of at their home in their studio alone, they come out and socialize and do the work in front of everybody. We have authors and artists collaborating at the table in front of everyone. We have instructors from the university drawing at the table with students who want to be in that field right across the table from them. That's an experience I didn't really have. Uh, in, in, uh, we have high school students coming out. They're wanting to go to art school and are meeting people who are in art school right now. And it's a really neat uh, kind of uh, dialogue happening across the table. And that was my experience uh, in every city that I've, that I've done. You're a community then. builder. I That's hope so. Amazing. And, and really, it, it's me trying to uh, find my place in the community and to find out who's amazing and making things. And Coming up in uh, the new year, uh, we'll be starting to look at opportunities for, uh, I've been taking some artists out into the community with me to do chalk art on the streets uh, here in Lethbridge and in Medicine Hat and in Didsbury and uh, just looking for some more opportunities like that. Uh, watch for us popping up in uh, neighborhoods or uh, just literally right out on the street <laughs> making some chalk art. Wow, that's very cool. Absolutely. Absolutely.